Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, I'm slowly moving books away from my bookshelf and into a different bookshelf that is a thousand times more stable. <laughs> In the corner of my room over there, it's off camera, but I get the impression that this is likely gonna fall any day. And uh, yeah, I don't wanna I don't want to be underneath it when it does. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's video, we're going to be looking at the third argument that the Quran makes to convince people who aren't Muslims, usually Christians or Jews, but not always, that the Quran is actually from Allah, from God, not of man-made origin. It is of divine origin. These are God's words. Man has had nothing to do with this whatsoever. Nothing at all. It's not that man was inspired to write the words of God, but no, 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 this is actually God's words. Keep that in mind. Now you can check out the last two videos I did. You can click here or check, click here, roughly here. And you can check out part one and part two, where the Quran said that because it's from God, it will not have many contradictions in it, which is a strange kind of argument. And the other argument being that the Quran is inimitable. You cannot produce something like the Quran. The Quran is just in a category of its own. Therefore, it must be from God. So those are the two arguments I've covered already. But in this video, we're going to look at the third argument, which is the idea that you should believe that Muhammad is really a prophet and the Quran is really the word of God because what Muhammad is saying and hence what the Quran is saying confirms what the Christians and Jews already have with them. In other words, the Quran isn't anything new. It isn't changing any foundational truth that is revealed through the previous scriptures given to the Jews and Christians, but rather it is confirming them. And because it confirms them, the Jews and the Christians can have confidence that the Quran is actually just a continuation of their own scriptures. It just continues the story from where the Gospels left it or from where the Torah left it. Now, as always, there are those who want to deny that this is the case. But in all honesty to them, I have to say just one thing. Just read the Quran. Like, just read it. It's The Quran is filled with verses where it makes absolutely clear it confirms it. This is nothing but something that confirms what you already have. The Quran makes the argument again and again and again in countless verses just how much it confirms what they already have. Who is it that it's talking about? The Jews and the Christians. What is it they have? The Injil and the Torah and possibly some other stuff. What is it the Quran is affirming? All of that. <laughs> The Quran could not make it clearer through all of the verses it contains that it is a continuation of the previous scriptures. It is explicit about it again and again and again and again and again. You would have to read the Quran with your eyes closed to not notice this. I'm not talking about one verse or two verses or three verses or four verses or five. I'm talking about every other over and over and over again. It just keeps saying it. It just keeps affirming it. There's no way of avoiding this. And just think about this rationally. Just take a moment to reflect upon this. The Quran contains stories, although they have been modified and they're not exactly the same. They have changes in them. But it contains stories that we know are in the Torah. It talks about Musa, which is Moses. It talks about Abraham. It talks about Joseph. It talks about Jonah. It, it talks about all these characters. It talks about Isa, which is, as we know, Jesus. It talks about these characters as if it's just telling you things you already know. And we know, historically speaking, that much of the Quran actually predates the Quran, in which the stories, which are not just copying from the Torah and the Injil with slight variations, but there are other stories that come from other sources, which is bizarre. Like, for example, the Syriac Infancy Gospel, which ultimately traces back to the Gospel of Thomas, the Proto-Evangelion of James, the Quran quotes from, and even non-Christian or Jewish sources like the Alexander Romance. The only way to make sense of this is if the Quran simply is confirming these stories as being true, and that's why it repeats them, or at least attempts to repeat them. If that's not the case, then it's very confusing for the reader because the reader is being told, hey, remember Abraham? Remember that time with the fire and Abraham escaped the fire? Do you remember the time when he broke the statues and he tried to blame the bigger statue and lied about it? That's Surah 21, by the way. We find this in Genesis Rabbah, in Genesis tradition, that the rabbinic Jews at the time of Muhammad used to have as part of their exegesis of the Torah. A similar version of the story is also found in the Book of Jubilees. So obviously the Quran wants to claim continuation of prior traditions that the Christians and Jews had. And Muhammad is very clear, or whoever wrote the Quran is very clear, that it is absolutely a reason for the Jews and the Christians to believe in him and believe the Quran is from Allah, precisely because it's a continuation of it. The Quran agrees with these things. It gives it the thumbs up. It's like, yeah, that Torah, that Injil, great stuff. And you can be confident of this because I'm confirming it. 
So let's break this down into why that's such a poor argument. Point number one, just because you confirm something doesn't mean that that thing you're confirming agrees with you. For example, I could tell you until the cows come home that there is a guy called James and I confirm everything James says. I confirm everything he says. I know about his political views, I know about his religious views, I know about his views on science, on maths, on different theories of the world. I agree with all of it. I confirm what he says and that is why you can believe me because I confirm what James says. Now, even if you turn out to be James's best friend and you knew James since he was a child, you would die for that guy. You absolutely, you treasure the ground that he walks on and you hold his views in the highest regards. Does that mean that you're gonna immediately trust what I say? Just because I tell you that I confirm what James says? Do you think you'll still trust me <laughs> if it turns out that, say for example, when you listen to me speak, my views are a total and complete opposite of what James says and that you know James says. In fact, you'd think I was kind of a charlatan if I told you that I just represent James, I just confirm what James says, but you know full well that James says the opposite of what I say. You would run a mile and go, hey, James, this guy, this Chris guy, he don't trust this guy. He keeps saying that he confirms what you say, but then he says the total opposite. Likewise here, just because you confirm something doesn't mean that that thing you're confirming or that person you're confirming maybe happens to agree with you. The only way you can find that out is by doing your own research and reading into what that person says. Like for example, what did Jesus say in the gospels? What did Moses say in the Torah? And then comparing it with what Muhammad says in the Quran and the Hadith. And then you realize they totally contradict and complete opposites. Jesus spends a significant amount of time in the gospels trying to explain how he is in many ways divine. Both him and his disciples make this point over and over again, but Muhammad does basically the exact opposite of this, <laughs> and spends a lot of the Quran trying to deny that there is any truth to this. In the Gospels, it is quite clear that you have three divine distinct persons within the one God. You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Muhammad gets confused and thinks that it's Allah, Jesus, and Mary. Fun fact, guys, that's probably because the Quran has been borrowed and the original meaning of the text was not that. It was rather a particular argument against a certain understanding of the Trinity. But as the Muslims understand that text today, they think that's correct. They genuinely think that Christians believe Allah, Isa, and Mary are three separate gods. Which um, kind of tells you all you need to know about how educated Islamic teaching is about other religions. The second big issue I have with this, and this is something that scholars like Gabriel Reynolds, I know I keep bringing him up, but I really admire what this guy has done in his academic work and I've been quite influenced by his work. He makes a point that the Quran doesn't seem to care what the canonical understanding of the Injil is. And I would probably say that we know that it affirms Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for two main reasons. One is the early Islamic scholars thought that's what the Injil was. But the second reason is that the Quran has biblical inflections in its text that seem to originate with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So it seems to be aware of them. But the other issue is that the Quran quotes things that have just not been considered as part of the Injil. Like the things I mentioned before, right? So the Proto-Evangelion of James, the Syriac Infancy Gospel, they weren't considered the Injil, but the Quran quotes them anyway. And it does so in a pretty unashamed way. It, it's not sort of coincidence, it's definitely explicit. The Quran quotes very specific stories that have their origin in these texts and not in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John accounts. So it seems as if the Quran thinks that those other texts are the Injil, at least in some sense. So according to the Quranic authors, the Injil is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Syriac Infancy Gospel, and the Proto-Evangelion of James, to name a few. There's probably more texts it thinks are the Injil. So why is that significant? It's significant because when the Quran keeps saying this has been sent down, this Quran, this revelation through Muhammad is sent down to confirm what you have with you, again, at the present time, there's obviously a historical context to this. Where is Muhammad based? Well, he's in the Hejaz for most of his life. Okay, so if he's in the Hejaz and we know where that is, we can then look at what the historical beliefs were of that area and we can see what they actually believed at the time. What did the people in the Hejaz think that the Injil was? What did the people of the Hejaz think the Torah was? What did they think of the Syriac Infancy Gospel? What did they think of the Proto-Evangelion of James? When we dig deeper into this, it's gonna cause a significant wedge because Muslims can say on one hand, well, okay, maybe the Injil is all these things. Maybe the Quran is just confirming this because Allah knows best. We just take that for granted that the Quran is always true. You know, it's a big circle, but that's okay. We're gonna do it anyway. You know, 
10 toes down, we're gonna go in this, it is what it is. But then you have this strange thing where, well, the Quran is meant to be for all mankind, but it seems as if the Quran is only dealing with a very small section of Christians and Jews that hold to heretical, unorthodox, minority views where the overwhelming rest of Christendom doesn't believe this. And then it seems hard to say that the Quran is really for mankind if one of the arguments it makes to be accepted by mankind depends on a very tiny, small group of people of whom we're still debating who they are and, and what they actually believe, but it's only relevant to them in Arabia. Why does the Quran make the argument that it confirms prior scriptures if those prior scriptures exist basically in a desert, in Arabia deserta, in a small place in the Hejaz, <laughs> that basically like a few hundred or a few thousand Christians and Jews believe in. The millions of other Christians across the world don't believe in this. They don't think the Syriac infancy gospel is authoritative or part of the Injil. They think Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are just the Injil. But this heretical group is, uh, is a representative of all mankind. And you might double down, and Muslims might double down. They might say, well, even so, this is just the truth. Allah is confirming it. Even if it is a bit weird, it's still fine. Okay, but then there's more issues. These texts that the Quran is quoting from contradict Islam in some cases, pretty major ways. The Syriac Infancy Gospel, if I remember right, starts off by appealing to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God. That's a very bizarre thing. I mean, that's the very first opening line, by the way, of the text. So if Muhammad is confirming this, and therefore Allah is confirming this as part of the Injil, that Jesus actually had revealed to him, kind of sounds like that contradicts Islam. I mean, trying to figure out how you navigate this is difficult enough with Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but all the divine statements about Jesus in those texts. Now you have to deal with all the divine statements in other texts and figure out how to match them up. You end up holding to bizarre and contradictory views where you have to say something like, well, generally, <laughs> the Quran confirms with these texts. Just ignore the parts that obviously contradict the entire themes written about in the Quran. But if you do that, then what are you really confirming? Well, you're not really confirming much of anything. In which case, Allah has a very strange view of what it means to confirm things. If Allah could confirm divine Jesus being talked about in the Gospels and the Syriac infancy Gospel and so on, then it seems as if he could basically confirm anything. If you believe that Allah can generally confirm things that have blatantly contradictory themes, not just odd passages but entire themes, there's nothing that stops you in principle from saying, well, Allah could confirm pagan texts. He just doesn't confirm the themes in it. Which of course would defeat the whole point of confirming a text or confirming a, an oral recitation or an oral tradition. But these are the issues that you find when you're dealing with the idea that the Quran has an argument for the world, because remember the Quran is for the whole world, that we can know it is from God because it confirms what was prior to it. But the issue is that it doesn't confirm what is prior to it. In fact, it doesn't confirm what's prior to it at all. It contradicts it in many ways. It is the foundation of a bigger argument called the Islamic Dilemma. You can check out some videos on my channel where I've covered the Islamic Dilemma before if you're interested. And the last point I just want to briefly make is that because the Quran confirms the prior scriptures, and this is a reason you should believe the Quran is from God, it means the Quran stands on the Christian belief and the Jewish belief, and it can never separate itself from it. The whole Islamic religion has to be seen through a Christian and Jewish lens before you can even get to Islam. Now, of course, you can believe Islam because you just don't want to know these things and you just plead willful ignorance. Look, you know, this is beyond me. I just want to have my Islam, my cake and eat it. Sure, but if you ever want to understand exactly why you believe what you believe, where it came from, its origins, the reason for certain doctrines that you hold as a Muslim, you need to understand Christianity and Judaism and why the Quran stands on top of those things. You can't cut off Judaism or Christianity because it's a bit like sitting on a tree branch and sawing off the branches you sit on it. It's a self-defeating objective. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. In the next video, we'll be doing the fourth argument in the series. And as always, if you are not a Christian, then today's the day. If you have any questions about the Christian faith, you can email me at chrisatspeakerscorner at gmail.com. My email is down below in the description box. And God bless you all and have a great day. Take care.